we are living in what has been called uh, a century of the city. The more we can do to understand the urbanization and the challenges and complexity, the better we can adjust to the humanitarian response. Let me just uh, start with a couple of figures. It's always good to keep proportions. Two-thirds of the global population is predicted to be living in cities by the year 2030. And urban, cent and urban centers are under pressure as they struggle to absorb the rapid increase of this population. Two-thirds of the global GDP is generated from 600 cities across the world, which make urban areas not only the focus of political and security uh, uh, concerns, which uh, is the issues uh, tonight, but also of economic interest. At the same time, armed conflicts are increasingly fought in urban environments with some 60 50 million people bearing the brunt of the consequences. A staggering 96% of urban growth is expected to take place in developing countries, in cities that are already facing fragility. Out of the 65 million people who are forcibly displaced today, 75% of those 65 million people live in urban areas. So the victims, the key victims, of what we have seen unfolding over the last five years of spreading and deepening of conflict environments in roughly 20 to 25 uh, key conflicts of the world, which are responsible for most of the displacements uh, in, in the world today, 75% of those people displaced uh, are displaced, uh, are urban displaced, are either uh, displaced from urban area or into uh, urban area. ICRC is preoccupied by two phenomena. I will focus in the first part uh, on, on one important aspect, but there is a, se a second aspect, two aspects, inherently related. The urbanization of warfare and the impact of violence on cities and their people, especially when those cities also face instability from underdevelopment, weak governance or criminal violence. So warfare is not the only area of concern today, but we see phenomenon of urban violence unfolding, which are not directly connected to international humanitarian law and urban warfare as uh, we discuss it. No surprise, therefore, that in my contacts with the US government as recently as last week, the conversation with several members of the US cabinet was very much on warfare in and around Mosul and its impact and consequences. That's what urban warfare, application of international humanitarian law, but also on the impact of urban violence in Central America on migration and the debate uh, in the United States, the impact that this has on uh, civilian population. We must uh, understand the dynamics, the tensions, the humanitarian demands of this environment so that our response can evolve and better address people's specific needs, which come from those two sources of violence. Many of the world's conflict affected cities, from Aleppo to Donetsk, from Gaza to Mogadishu, from Aden to Tripoli, are struggling to survive, struggling to ensure that people have the most basic services uh, are, are available from one day to the next. When wars are fought in cities, the vital infrastructure that make communities function is damaged or destroyed. There is often no safe water or to drink, electricity to power homes and businesses, health services to vaccinate or curate disease. Health and humanitarian workers are deliberately attacked and people are forced to leave looking for safety. ICRC recently completed a report drawing on 30 years of evidence to analyze the humanitarian response in urban areas and progressive deterioration of essential services during protracted armed conflicts. The report showed, to a considerable extent, the problems stem from the complexity of urban system and their dependency on large-scale interconnected infrastructure that rely on the availability of qualified staff to ensure service delivery. That's what makes the vulnerability of cities today. Interconnected infrastructure, highly specialized dependence dependency on highly specialized staff, and therefore we are qualitatively in another situation than maybe a couple of de decades ago. When a city is under fire, educational and employment opportunities are lost. As a result, 
Large numbers of people are internally displaced or seek refuge in neighboring countries, overburdening the capacities of the host city's infrastructure. It also leads to a brain drain effect as specialist skills of engineers, urban planners, and medical staff are lost. Let me just uh, interrupt for two uh, minutes to show you a brief video. Let's hope that te technology works. Normally it doesn't. But if it works, you will see uh, a video for two, uh, three minutes, which uh, we have done and which synthesizes the report that ICRC has done, capturing our uh, experience, as I have mentioned. The adaptation to the humanitarian approach is what I'm uh, talking a, a little bit over the next couple of minutes. It's often humanitarian actors like the ICRC that are the only international operators that can gain access to population in pro protracted conflict zones. And we are faced with the challenge of providing assistance over the course of their long struggle. What these long wars mean for the ICRC's work Humanitarian assistance was one thought as a short-term relief effort, but it's increasingly a long-term necessity in protracted urban contexts. In these situations, ICRC works on two timelines simultaneously. One that plans week to week, and another that looks two to five years ahead. We are then able to address immediate needs as well as future health, water, livelihoods, and protection systems that ensure people's survival and dignity. ICRC fixes and sets up water supply infrastructure destroyed by war. We support health facilities like hospitals and orthopedic centers and bring in mobile health clinics. We train locals to develop skills and not rely on foreign experts and we help people start sustainable small businesses through cash grants. For example, in Syria alone, the ICRC is maintaining essential water waste management and energy infrastructure for 18.5 million people. But ICRC does not stop at mitigating the impact of violence on urban populations. We focus as much on how wars in cities are conducted, on the limits that we must place on armed actors and their conduct in order to shrink the needs of people exposed to urban warfare. Logic follows that where there are more people and more weapons, there are more victims. An overwhelming percentage of people killed or injured by explosive weapons in populated areas in cities in urban areas are civilians. Civilians, not military targets. These are people who often are not taking part in the conflict. They are mothers and fathers and children who are not part of the fight and simply wish to lead their lives without the constant threat of bombs or gunfire. 
The Geneva Conventions and international humanitarian law speaks very clearly to the obligation during armed conflicts to protect civilians, uh, uh, civilian populations and objects. The specific challenge posed by urban warfare should be taken into account. Armed forces need to be prepared to address such challenges, considering the overarching objective of the laws of war, which is protection of populations, of civilians. Explosive weapons which have wide impact have a significant likelihood of indiscriminate effects when used in densely populated area. These include large bombs, imprecise artillery, multi-barrel rocket launchers, and certain types of improvised explosive devices. In the urban operations, armed forces have to take into account the vulnerability of large numbers of people and the intricacy and interconnectedness of essential services. They must avoid or minimize harm to civilians, including the choice in their choice of means and methods of attacks. In addition to the high risk of incidental civilian death, injury or disability, heavy explosive weapons tend to cause extensive damage to critical infrastructure, triggering debilitating domino effects on interconnected essential services. This is what the video has shown, that with each attack you have a further degradation, even if you repair the infrastructure afterwards, and so over time, over long-time conflicts in urban areas, you basically end up with nothing anymore to deliver social services. Current and recent armed conflicts, such as those in Syria, Ukraine, Afghanistan, Yemen, Iraq or Gaza, have exposed the particularly devastating effects on civilian of the use of heavy explosive weapons in populated areas. This impact in turn provokes further civilian death and displacements, and these effects are exacerbated when wars are long and drawn out. The ICRC is not blind to the difficulties of the battlefield. Notably, too often, an enemy will hide and fight in populated areas and endanger civilian populations. The anonymity of big urban areas support the unfortunate strategy of human shields, which is often the origin of a vicious cycle of behavior leading uh, to the disrespect of international law. The multiplicity of roles an individual can take from daylight civilian to nighttime fighter and back adds to the complexity of the battlefield in which civilian and military areas are increasingly intertwined and interconnected, while international humanitarian law would advise that we make a clear distinction between civilian areas and objectives and military objectives. So the reality is not anymore in sync with the prescription of the law. ICRC works to remind all parties to take precautions in peacetime and conflict to protect their people and avoid those situation uh, of, uh, uh, th that I just described. But military commanders have to face these challenges and have the responsibility to minimize the incidental effects on civilians of an attack. And in view of the devastating humanitarian consequences observed by us uh, at the ICRC on the ground, in such situation, serious questions are raised on how armed forces are interpreting and concretely implementing their military pro process, the relevant obligations of international humanitarian law. The onus is on them, on the militaries, to explain their choices, notably the choice of weapons when they conduct hostilities in those populated areas. While in the military there is often a lack of specific guidance on the choice of weapons in urban operations, some good practices exist and need to be shared and discussed. Unsurprisingly, with more detailed rules for military commanders, ICRC has a debate with those senior military commanders who feel unduly hampered by the multiplicity of restricting rules in achieving their military objectives, in fighting the adversary, who does often not respect the, the international law themselves. So there is a debate, and this is the core of our very often con uh, confidential dialogues we entertain with the militaries on an increasing number of laws which are seen as hampering uh, 
the ability to conduct hostilities with adversary which the military perceive as fundamentally new. This intricacy of asymmetric warfare are particularly difficult to manage in an environment, in the environments in which we are today. The balance between military necessity and protection of civilians, which is so core to international humanitarian law, is complicated to find in situation of imbalance. We see this debate as one of the entry points through which the non-reciprocity of international humanitarian law is challenged today by the asymmetry of many conflicts. Uh, it's a little bit complicated how I formulate this, but uh, let me just explain. It is asymmetric conflict which gives rise to this uh, cycle of violence where it is difficult to respect international humanitarian law when the adversary is not respecting the law. And then this gives the legitimacy again to violate the law. This is the reality of, our, of the arguments which we are facing today and particularly in those urban areas because these are the vulnerable hotspots in which uh, we are challenged. The debate uh, is exacerbated by uh, the whole issue of fighting terrorism or the war on terror as some call it, uh, which uh, adds to the complexity of this debate and gives to the one side always the impression of being the legitimate uh, uh, adversary in the theater of operation, while the other uh, seemingly is the illegitimate. So we have those complexities of uh, urban area which add uh, to the difficulties of interpreting the law. There is another aspect to consider in this debate. With massive impact of warfare in urban areas widely communicated, there is at least in one part of the global public opinion a tendency to consider any civilian victim of an armed conflict in urban area as a result of violations of international humanitarian law. In other parts of the public, populist demands for more intensified warfare on terrorists and others and no restraining rules in fighting, uh, in fighting is condoning torture, indiscriminate bombings and targeted killings. This politicization of public opinion around international humanitarian law, where one part of the public considers each victim a indication for violations and for ill-guided uh, interpretation of international humanitarian law, and the other part of the public is demanding more intensified and more indiscriminate warfare is one thing which of course preoccupies us in the public space because uh, it is difficult to argue uh, the subtleties of international humanitarian law in this public space. We have in uh, the studies we uh, have recently published on people on war, we could see this polarization of public opinions, which uh, clearly showed that while in theaters of conflict throughout the world, the public very well knows international humanitarian law, appreciates and supports international humanitarian law. The poll has also shown that in the United States and Switzerland, there is less support for a considerate interpretation of international humanitarian law and there is, are more demands to use this law in a much more indiscriminate, uh, indiscriminate way. So we do have in the global public opinion around urban warfare, around the interpretation of international humanitarian law, an increasingly polarized public opinion, and we have a difficult discourse to entertain with the security establishment which interprets international humanitarian law in a different way as they fight terrorism. This is the essence of the protection problem that we are confronted with. The underlying principles in all those discussions should never be forgotten. Foremost, it is civilians who must be protected and all should err on the side of their protection. 
It's on this premise that the ICRC is calling on all parties to arm conflicts to avoid the use of explosive weapons, which have a wide impact area in densely populated areas. But I would add that it is the first and foremost the dimension of suffering on, civilian uh, on civilians in complex and interconnected urban areas, which eventually has to lead to rethink military strategy in densely populated area. This was a point I made today. I was in Brussels on the Syrian conference, uh, which I emphasize very strongly. At a certain moment, while we can have academic debate on how to interpret international humanitarian law, when you are confronted with those huge dimensions of problems, this should, uh, should have a con as a consequence a fundamental political reassessment by the political authorities. Because it's a difference while in in the law, it is not a difference whether you violate the law towards one person or 100 person. In quality, it is a big difference whether you are confronted with 50 million displaced people, with havoc uh, in the international system, with failing social structures, or whether you don't have these mass displacements. So I do believe that what we need today is a fundamental reassessment in the light of impact of modern warfare in cities, of what the precautionary measures and interpretation of international humanitarian law have to be. Some of the most extreme suffering in armed conflict in to, uh, are in today's towns and cities and is experienced by people living under siege. The price of civilian victims is simply too high in the dynamics of what we are witnessing today. International humanitarian law sets out clear rules about humanitarian conduct that are relevant to siege. These rules must be respected, further elaborated, refined, to avoid starvation and collapse of health and water services generating severe humanitarian consequences for besieged populations. We see it each and every day in Syria and in many other places. Humanitarian workers need better access to repair damaged infrastructures. We need days of tranquility uh, in order to be able to deliver humanitarian assistance. We need safety zones which are protected zones in order in the context of international humanitarian law and based on humanitarian law and not just as, as dumping grounds to dispose of refugees which you don't want to host on your territory. We need a different framework in order to be able to protect more seriously uh, the people who are suffering from the impact of warfare in urban areas. Negotiations must allow for a disentanglement of civilians and fighters. This is something we have uh, increasingly sophisticated as a methodology at ICRC in the light of the Syrian and Iraqi conflict in particular. Screening procedures today uh, is an important element that we add uh, in the outskirts of Mosul and, uh, and Fallujah and in, in other places where we have been active, accompanying uh, the respective armies in order to do due process screening procedures, which allow us quickly to separate civilian populations to assist them and eventually to visit those who are detained because of suspicion of, uh, of terrorism and violations of international humanitarian law. There is no question that uh, uh, Aleppo comes to mind and uh, I don't want to be too long and too graphic, but I think the recent evacuation negotiation is a good example of what the whole challenges uh, ICRC is confronted with, uh, the whole challenges that we find ourselves in in present day conflicts. The invisible scars that people are left with can not be underestimated either. Wars affect people in very deep and profound ways. While it is difficult to predict the long-term impact of those who live in war zones, for example, the children of Mosul, it is likely to have severe effects which we should not overlook. And this is another important issue which uh, I think is worthwhile highlighting. While over decades we have always interpreted humanitarian assistance and protection work around the same areas of work. It's about water, shelter, medicine, uh, uh, food. It's, that was classic humanitarianism. But with the type of warfare today, we have humanitarian needs which are expanding into psychosocial needs for traumatized children. 
into completely different way into educational needs because uh, children are for a long time not able to go back to school. And here again, urban areas have their specificity. So my point here is that urban warfare and its impact does not only change the way the law has to be interpreted, it also changed the fundamentals under which we interpret humanitarian activities. And it draws us to become much more broader and much more responsive to those hyper-fragile situations in which we find ourselves. I just have been uh, two weeks ago in the Donbass, and it is interesting to see what this highly industrialized and populated area, uh, how the war has affected the populations. Over 400 kilometers, roughly 500,000 people have displaced, uh, have been displaced out of those urban areas. It affects fundamentally the economic fabrics. It uh, leaves uh, people traumatized. It uh, leads to all those multiple phenomena which I have described beforehand. As I mentioned at the beginning, I don't want uh, uh, to just focus on the urbanization of warfare, but wanted very briefly also to talk to you uh, on the second related trend occurring in today's cities, which, uh, to which we pay close attention at the ICRC. The rapid urbanization we are seeing in non-typically war context, but which are fragile cities, places like Bamako, Caracas, El Salvador, where violence is accelerating, fueling by, the tra by drug trade and mass unemployment and civil unrest. It may be interesting uh, for you to recognize, if we look at the statistics of violent cities, not of cities at war, but of violent cities, that some of the death tolls by firearm in violent cities are higher than some of the death toll by war in Syria. So in some months last year, we had higher death toll uh, per month by firearms in Salvador or in certain uh, cities uh, in Latin America than we had in Syria. So it underlines the seriousness of fragile, vulnerable cities due to massive urbanization, poverty, underdevelopment, fragile contexts uh, with which we are dealing. The correlation between urbanization and violence is unquestionably a complex one with many factors at play, such as social inequality, unequal distribution of resources, lack of investment, low levels of education, and high unemployment. This is particularly troublesome, as we know that an increasing percentage of global wealth, as I mentioned at the beginning, comes from economic growth in urban areas. Urban violence, therefore, does not only endanger people's lives, but also potentially affects the global economy. More than 1.5 billion people, including 350 million of the world's extreme poor, live in an environment of continuous fragility, violence and conflict. That is a huge number of people at risk. It's reported that 10 times more people die outside of conflict than in times of conflict. And the lines between violence and armed conflict are increasingly blurred. ICRC works to reduce this fluidity through legal guidance. But what we know is that violence contributes to fragility, and the fragility can quickly lead to conflict. It is clear that in many of the cities of Latin America, and you may have seen the economic statistics, that out of the 50 most violent cities in the world, 47 are in Latin America. Uh, when you look at those statistics, and when you see the type of crime and the weapons that the criminals have in those contexts, they resemble the weapons of armies. So that's not anymore just the, the criminal with a, with a gun or a knife. Uh, this is much more sophisticated, and that's the blurring of situations of general fragility that I have spoken, and of warfare uh, at the same time. We have started in those hyper-fragile contexts in Latin America to, to pilot project, and these pilot projects, they need completely different ways on which we do, again, humanitarian work, because it's not parties to conflict that, that we are talking. We have to talk to the local police, to the civil society, to the Red Cross society, to the local businesses, to the local leaders, to the community leaders, to the tribes, to the religious leaders. And so 
this is a completely different framework in which we address violence in urban areas and at the same time we try to take advantage of the lessons learned that we have been able to learn over decades of cities at war and see how can we learn from our past ex experience in warfare and how can we transfer some of this project experience, some of the way we define the responses, some of the ways of engagement with the community, with the businesses again, with the religious leaders, with the community leaders. And this brings us, of course, again, into a completely new ball game of uh, humanitarian assistance and protection work. Let me just highlight uh, a last example in uh, this evening's introduction. I think the conf confluence of urban crime, economic impact and warfare to me is in no country so clearly visible as in Yemen, where you have an armed conflict on the one side, it's the poorest and uh, internationally dependent economy uh, in the Middle East, and it is so fragile that the war has destroyed the ports facility of Yemen. And because the ports facility are destroyed, you can't import any more anything uh, in reasonable dimensions into Yemen. So there is no economy anymore and no regular economy, despite the fact that there is, and on top of the war, you get a hyper fragile economy, which is basically coming to a stop because the two ports have been bombed by the war. So what do you do with the few things that are here? Uh, you have weapons, you have crime. And so it's very difficult to distinguish then in each and every day and each and every violent uh, event to which you are confronted. Is this an armed conflict in which international humanitarian law is applicable and where we have parties to conflict to talk to and to engage with? Or is this just crime because of the lack of economic opportunities, uh, the destruction that has taken place, the fragility of the situation in which countries find themselves? I have uh, tried to confuse you tonight with those two approaches. And the objective of confusion is that uh, I came here not actually to talk too much uh, of what we are doing, but to encourage in particular uh, the scientific community to work with us and to do research in those areas. Because I do believe uh, we are at a threshold on what is happening in society with regard to fragility, violence, and conflict. And this challenges us on how we approach those hyper-fragile contexts, which may be rooted in war or in underdevelopment, and leads to instability, uh, which is much broader than the context themselves. That's what we are witnessing, and I think we need more facts, we need more interpretations, we need more ideas, we need to brainstorm on how we cope with a situation where the traditional frameworks are still useful, applicable, but maybe not conducive to find all the solutions. And I think this is my interest tonight to engage with you now over the next uh, half hour or however time you have uh, into a discussion. I'll stop it here. Thanks a lot. Oui, c'est une bonne idée. Water is always a good idea. Yeah. So, thank you so much for this uh, very impressive and stimulating uh, presentation. So, the floor is open uh, for questions and in agreement with our speaker. I will uh, give first the preference to students however you define them. Um, so, Yeah, that's please. a good question. <laughs> so please, uh, who wants to start? Over there? Please. Uh, um, present, you look like a student. Present yourself. And, Hi, uh, my name is Peter Kylie Bergen, and I'm visiting the institute. I was recently accepted into the Master in International Affairs program. 
Thank you very much for your talk and the worthwhile work that you do. I was talking with a friend of mine recently who studies economics and he said something that I found very intriguing. He told me that we're living in an age where people are restrained by borders but capital or money is not. And in his opinion, that is not sustainable and it kind of creates tremendous inequality. And I'm curious if you see a link between hyper fragile urban environments and um, you know places in the world where we've shut off the flow of international capital and, and people are stuck there? Well, where I definitely see a link, when, when I look at the context in which we operate and which are uh, some of the, of the very hyper-fragile contexts, and while this is not the core what ICRC does, it's, it's not to look at the root causes of conflict, but to mitigate the effects, but still, uh, we can't just shut our brain and, and out and, and, and we reflect on what we see. And when we see those hyper-fragile contexts and you start to engage with populations and you, you start to see what are the drivers of violence which bring them to take arms and to engage in this cycle which leads to fragility, then the, it's not really poverty that comes as a first argument, but it's exclusion and discrimination. And exclusion and discrimination, they can have economic impact, and they have, can have economic drivers, but not only. It's a multiplicity of factors. So exclusion from capital can be, or from the capital markets can be a driver of fragility at the end of the day, because all forms of exclusion and discrimination are what people somehow, what drives people into desperation. And when they are desperate, uh, they, and they, when they don't see the opportunities to take charge of their lives themselves, when they don't have access to jobs, when they don't have access to uh, look for their lives themselves, when their environment is one of exclusion and discrimination by state power, by administration, which is often an exclusive, is, is a policy of exclusion, that's what drives violence. And I think we, we can argue then each and every context is specific and has other drivers, but uh, it is very clear to us at the present moment that most of the, the environments in which we are are not any more environments in which poverty is a driver of violence, but violence is destroying development, and development and discrimination is driving violence of people and is driving people into violence because they don't see other options than taking up the arms against what they feel is exclusion. And I think these dynamics, we, we, we have to understand them and we have to look at the specificities because, uh, again, each and every context that we know has, has then other dynamics. The state has different strengths, the state has different tactics on how to deal with those populations. There are some who, who, who engage into negotiations with their civil societies, others who shoot at them, and that makes a difference. Hello, I'm, my name's Tamara. I'm a second year student in the Masters of International Affairs. And I had a question in regards to new technologies and digital technologies in terms of how they would shape the response to um, armed conflict in these urban areas. Well, of course, we engage a lot, uh, as many other humanitarian organization, in reflecting and testing new technologies in terms of analysis of the situation, delivery, uh, raising money, connectivity. These are all issues which today fundamentally change the way we deliver humanitarian assistance. So there is a transformation which is a technologically driven transformation of humanitarian delivery which is happening. Uh, I think the most significant 
part of it, and the most visible part of it is the replacement of the transfer of good into the transfer of cash. In many of the environments in which we are, we go from, uh, we, we move away from delivering the bulkware to the people. And wherever there is something like a market, we deliver cash to the people so that they can buy, buy the bulkware themselves. But having cash services needs technology. You need to have people with credit cards and identity documents, and you need data protection, and you need the whole bulk of new technology which is available. But uh, when I say all this, and I can go on for five or ten minutes on, on these new technologies, but I won't, but I, I, I bring one caveat. At the end of the day, what makes us access and the humanitarian space is not technology. We can't overcome obstacles through technology. Obstacles are overcome by negotiations. And negoti a humanitarian negotiation is a negotiation around consensus amongst those who take arms and are engaged into violence. So at the end of the day, what is interesting always to see is, while technology can help, it doesn't create you the humanitarian space. You have to negotiate this humanitarian space with all those who are there, physically there, and in control of territory and population. So I have, a, as you see, I have a very old-fashioned and a very modern reply to your question. Uh, yes, we try to go up front towards using new technology, exploring those new technology, looking whether they can help us. And at the end of the day, it's the intuition of the frontline negotiator who has the network, the trust, the ability to shape a consensus because what makes humanitarianism compared to anything else? A political negotiation is a negotiation around power. A humanitarian negotiation is a negotiation framed by the law and trying to create a space, which is consensual. And that's a difference. That's a different type of negotiation. And this type of negotiation is irreplaceable. And that's to just give 10 seconds of uh, publicity spot. Mm -hmm. I still believe that's what ICRC does best. Mm -hmm. We have a question from a quasi-student, uh, Ashim Weinman, who is a researcher at a center that uh, might interest you, Peter. Yes. Which is the Center on Conflict, Development and Peace Building here at the Graduate Institute. Thank you very much. I would say 17 years and still here. Um, <laughs> thank you. I'd like to inquire you on the issue of scale. Um, from what we read in the news and what we see every day, it seems that challenges and problems are growing faster. Than the, th than the solutions we have that we find for them. So by focusing on cities, both war in cities, but also violence in cities, we are multiplying both the locations of humanitarian engagements, but also the scale in which we need to find the solutions through dialogue and negotiation. So I wonder what are your reflections on this, Peter? Thank you. That, that, that's right. Uh, I mean, my, my point tonight was we go into city because of scale. Uh, and, but I looked at scale first and foremost from the impact uh, side of violence. But it is, of course, clear that what we would hope also is that cities give us the scale which allows us to turn the trend to the negative. It's a little bit like all those statistics that we have seen over the last 10 years with regard to development and the big powers in which development has taken place. If you get development in China and India right, the statistics normally tell you that the world is developing because the numbers are big. If you get things in cities right, with the, with the basic statistics uh, that I showed you uh, at the beginning because of the contribution of cities to global GDP, because of the number of people uh, who are there then you get it right. But let's not fool ourselves, Achim. 
the, the problem is that cities are also more complex. So at the end of the day, you don't escape one problem, which I find is at the origin of this big discrepancy that we are witnessing between galloping problems and insufficient responses. And I still believe that this is a problem of political investment. We invest in the wrong things, or we insufficiently invest into finding solution. And this is a problem of political as, uh, uh, allocation of resources and energy. It's not a problem that we can just go to, to cities, have a mi miracle solution and scale. It's unfortunately more complex. At the end of the day, you always go to back to square one. Even when you want to scale in cities, you need to build the consensus that what you do is the right thing you do. Has the community support, is rooted in the society, has the support of the local economy. And this is an investment into generating consensus and is a political task is, even if the frame is a humanitarian one, it is a negotiated uh, context. And I, I truly believe that one of the big problems is that not only that there are people out there who don't want, but that those who want underinvest. And we need much more investment in those negotiating skills, in negotiating efforts, in being persistent in negotiating these contexts, in being inclusive in negotiating these contexts. You can screw up your city program and have an inability to scale if you don't include those who, who have a say in the community. And this is, I, I, I increasingly believe that we, we have to be careful not to be too technocratic in our vision on what should be done in order to solve some of the big problems that we have. And so, so you are right, it's a great place if you get it right to go to a city and to address humanitarian problems in a city, but you still have to get it right. And uh, here in Geneva, we have a lot of experience, I understand. This is, uh, je ne veux pas uh, uh, faire violence à cette, uh, à cette ville, mais c'est un canton qui, qui est une ville, et une ville qui est un canton. On peut le dire. So you can test it. You know how complicated this is. <laughs> oui, c'est un étranger qui dit ça. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Tarek. I'm a um, student in international relations here at the University of Geneva. Uh, I'm also a member of the European Youth Parliament. Um, and civilian casualties used to be um, collateral damage, it seems. Um, for example, if you take the Battle of Solferino, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there were about uh, 50,000 uh, soldier deaths and only one civilian death in one day, which seems ridiculous nowadays because the system has changed so much. Um, so now civilians seem to be taken as objects of war, um, as targets even. And I'm wondering, um, with the inherently chaotic nature of the international system, is it possible to go back to a somewhat civilized, um, somewhat organized system of war uh, and more generally international system? Thank you. Well, we have firmly to believe that this is possible. That's our task. <laughs> so it will be possible. Uh, but I, I mean, you, you are right in the, in the analysis. We all know the trends. And what we see is really kind of probably an accentuation and peak of trend that I was myself really quite flabbergasted to, to notice over the last couple of years. Not only that mm. civilians are collateral damage, as you rightly say, because they come, become primary objectives of the military attack now. So those who, according to the conventions, are those who are particularly protected, hospitals, civilians, detainees, today are those who are 
primarily targeted. So you have to ask your question, what is happening here? And why is this happening? And, and I think it's, it's the policy of attacking the weakest link, which is the logic, again, of exclusion, not having a common ground with the adversary, is the logic of politicizing the context of, of humanitarian relief so that the civilians who are an object of humanitarian relief become at the same time uh, object of a political negotiation. This is what we are encountering in today's context. That's the very point that we are in at the present moment. That if you are a soldier today, in Syria you get pretty good treatment. Whether you are Islamic State, al-Nusra, uh, whatever, or Syrian army, you have your supply chain. chain. Those who are objects of attacks are those who are the weakest uh, in the chain. And this is what is preoccupying. That's where I see the responsibility of ICRC also to engage with all those arms bearers, independently on what their status is, and to nudge them into behavior. And then you see when you talk to those different parties that we are, again, in a transformational system where the reciprocity is what is critical at the present moment. Civilians are attacked because the other side attacks civilians. And the other side attacks civilians because this side attacks civilians. So that's the vicious circle you have to cut through. And so you, you can only cut through if you negotiate trust with all sides that certain things should not happen. And so we are, sometimes I say, we are in a pre-Solferino situation where the consensus on basics has to be renegotiated. Not, get me right here, I'm, I'm not renegotiating humanitarian law. I, I simply see that it is not carried forward by those who carry arms. So in order to spread what behavior is, you have to engage with those people and then to, to start at the bottom, at the very bottom, to renegotiate trust. That's at the end of the day what humanitarianism is about. Uh, it is that even in the worst of wars, you agree that certain things should not happen or certain things should happen to certain people. Two more questions, here and there. Thank you. Uh, my name, <coughs> sorry, my name is Donna Landau. I'm a research coordinator at the Inclusive Peace and Transition Initiative here at the Graduate <coughs> Institute. And my question is about prevention. Um, there is this saying that what one spends on uh, remedying the effects of conflict, if one once spent that on prevention, one could have achieved uh, much more, it would be more efficient. And the UN seems to be focusing on that with the sustaining peace resolution and this idea of prevention as something that happens all the time. You're either preventing the outbreak, the recurrence, or the continuation and escalation of a conflict. And I wonder what you think about this um, um, sort of new shift or twist in the UN's approach. Is it because you think, do you think that this is really going in a fruitful direction in terms of where the Secretary General is taking it? Or is it maybe partly to do with the um, hesita hesitance about supporting uh, your work or also the funding struggles that you're in? Thank you. No, I, I, I've, I think it's, it's great that uh, Antonio Guterres is moving the, the UN towards conflict, much more towards conflict prevention. I think that's the very core of what his mandate is. I was much more critical uh, with regard to what the UN did maybe over the last five to ten years because of the lack of political will to engage on conflict prevention to continuously making out of every political question a humanitarian issue. And I think this is what has hampered and has confused 
a lot of spirits that we had a UN system which at the core is a political system which needs to think and work towards peace and preventing conflict and respecting human rights. And because this was difficult and was difficult to achieve, the system has easily moved into delivering humanitarian assistance and pretending that it is neutral, impartial and independent. While it is a states-driven system, which again brought it into an uneasy balance. So I warmly welcome that the new SG is, because of he suffered, to be very frank, from this trend, and he has experienced it as a high commissioner, is now as a secretary general making very different accents. I think for us this also means that we have to intelligently relate while being distinct on what this means for a humanitarian actor. And it is obvious that when we talk about prevention, we don't talk about conflict prevention because this is a highly political concept. It's the way to peace. When we talk about prevention, then we talk about preventing violations of international humanitarian law, which is still used in Bello. It's still the framework in which we operate. But then it is also clear to me from what I see that the impact of good humanitarian work is good for peace. It's not done because it is co preventing conflict. It's not done because it should lead to peace, but it has the consequence of stabilizing society. If you wouldn't do good humanitarian work, and good humanitarian work, again, to go back to the different question is establishing basic consensus in communities at the bottom of where we can start. And this is the first step to reconciliation. And it's not yet something big, but it's, it's then a basis on which political actors come, come, come in, invest into much more preventive approaches. And that's also, if we, if we have an intelligent way, and, and Antonio and myself do discuss these issues quite a lot these days, on connecting good humanitarian practice as done by ICRC and other neutral, impartial, and independent humanitarian organization, this is a good terrain on which much more ambitious conflict prevention and peace policies can build upon. The last question here. <clears throat> Thank you very much. My name is Defne Gönac. I'm a PhD student. Still lucky to be a student. <laughs> Uh, well, continuing from the conflict prevention question, uh, so do you think we will ever put, uh, be able to put an end to the history of conflict uh, without actually putting an end to the profitability of uh, arm making or weapon production? Well, if you ask a question like that, no. <laughs> <laughs> because... It is obvious that uh, as long as there is an economic driver of conflict, you'll get conflict. That's what you are asking for. If you put the economic system in a way that it produces interest and, in, and into, into weaponry and conflict and, and, and option, then not. So I'm, I'm deeply convinced that... Uh, but here I'm going far beyond being a president of ICRC. That's just as Peter Maurer, I can tell you I'm deeply convinced that sound prevention and peace policy has to have a socio-economic basis. And this socio-economic basis, I can only, in squaring my head, uh, really think that this is something which can produce... Uh, weaponries and, uh, and can attach big profit to uh, the military-industrial complex. That's very difficult to imagine. So it goes with creating uh, 
new forms of social economic systems that you have to have peace. That's what my reply also earlier this evening was. If we look from the other side of the equation at the drivers of conflict and violence, it's again exclusion, and exclusion has an economic dimension. Yes, we have to, I'm afraid we have to stop, and uh, I'm sorry for the pre- and post-students who couldn't ask questions. Um, but uh, I would like uh, you to join me in uh, thanking our speaker to have come from uh, uh, the top of the hill to the lowlands oh. to, 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 to bring us uh, such a... Uh, enlightening confusion, so thank you so much. From the arid mountains to the wonderful uh, pastures yes. of the flatlands. <laughs>